of nitrogen and protein. So I beg you, let us do what is necessary to see to it Food and Drug has the funds that they need to do the job to protect the American people. I thank my good friend for yielding to me. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. On that, Mr. Chairman, I ask for a record vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Utah rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The the will the gentleman specify the number of the amendment? Uh, number 13. The amendment. We'll designate the amendment. Amendment number 13, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a simple amendment to uh, uh, limit the subsidies for mohair. Mohair is something that back in the World War II we needed for our military uniforms. The problem is we haven't used mohair in our military uniforms since the Korean War, and yet the subsidies still continue. So this is a common sense amendment to simply limit this. This is roughly $1 million a year. This is something that Congress has in previous had eliminated. It crept back in. And this limitation agreement, uh, amendment that I offer, I would urge my colleagues to vote for. My understanding is there's no opposition on either side of the aisle. And with, with that understanding, I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman, we accept our, I support the amendment and yield back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the amendment is agreed to. <laughs> what purpose does the gentleman from Utah rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk designated as number 14. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 14, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I would hope this body would uh, take this amendment uh, at the same, uh, <laughs> at the same pace that we did uh, the mohair subsidies, but uh, uh, perhaps not. Uh, this amendment here seeks to eliminate the cotton and peanut storage payments that we have been making. I would pre uh, point out to my colleagues that President Obama recommended terminating this program in his fiscal 2012 budget. No other agricultural commodities receive this type of assistance. I'd like to read a paragraph that's found on the web, uh, whitehouse.gov website. The credits allow producers to store their cotton and peanuts at the government's cost until prices rise. Therefore, storage credits have a negative impact on the amount of commodities on the market. Because storage is covered by the, uh, covered by the government, producers may store their commodities for longer than necessary. There is no reason the government should be paying for the storage of cotton or peanuts, particularly since it does not provide this assistance for any other commodities. And so, what, end quote. That is the quote from the, web, what the website. Um, I happen to concur with the president on this. I hope my colleagues would find this to be a common sense amendment to say we should not be specifying winners and losers in this particular case we're going to offer a storage credit for just cotton and just peanuts um, it's something that i think should be eliminated i'd hope the body would concur i would hope we would understand that uh, we're going to have to make some changes the way we do things this is one instance where i actually agree with the president i'm proud to stand in support of that and would urge my colleagues to support this amendment and i'll yield back and yields back what, for what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, purpose I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman will suspend. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Uh, rise in opposition to the amendment. Strike the last word. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment to eliminate storage and handling payments for cotton and peanuts. I represent a lot of producers of these commodities, and I guess it makes me a little bit more sensitive to why storage and handling is an important part of our agricultural policy and why this amendment could have potentially devastating impacts if allowed to become law. I believe it's in the best interest of our country to support domestic agriculture, 
If you think our reliance on foreign oil is a nightmare, imagine what it would be like if we had to rely that much on foreign sources of food and fiber. For that reason, it's been the policy of the Congress for decades to provide a safety net to help protect domestic farmers when prices are low and world markets are unfavorable. If you represent farm country, or if you've ever worked on a farm bill, you have some idea of what a delicate balance can be to use the different tools at our disposal to craft a law that meets the needs of farmers and consumers. Different commodities have different economies. Uh, prices sometimes swing wildly. Sometimes even biological differences need to be accounted for. For example, if peanuts are not stored correctly, they can develop toxicity that renders them not only useless, but dangerous to the consumer. Storage and handling assistance have been developed as an efficient policy for peanuts because it not only gives the farmer some latitude about how long he can store his crops, but it also improves food safety for the public. Mr. Chairman, I was on the Ag Committee back in 2008 when we crafted the last farm bill. It's been the law of the land since then and will continue to be until next year. It's the basis on which every farmer has planned during that time. This amendment creates uncertainty for those farmers. It threatens their jobs and it threatens the domestic production the rest of us depend on. I believe this amendment is bad policy and I urge my colleagues to reject it. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose the gentleman from Texas rise? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, also oppose the amendment. Uh, this amendment does not save uh, one nickel in uh, fiscal 2012. Uh, it's a bit theater, uh, and unlike mohair, the peanuts and cotton have a little different uh, circumstances. And the, uh, the storage that uh, is talked about here is only paid uh, if the prices for these two commodities drops below their loan rate. CBO does not estimate this to happen for the next decade uh, in terms of these prices. The loan rates are substantially below uh, the, where the current prices are. That means the producers pay for these uh, storage costs as, the, uh, uh, as these products are moved uh, to market. So this amendment, uh, while we debate it for some 15 to 20 minutes, will cost more to debate than it will save on the, uh, uh, at the, for the taxpayers. It is an integral part of the safety net that these producers rely upon. And you've heard this over and over tonight. Uh, the Ag Committee is the best suited to develop a proper safety net and ag policy for this country. This country's had an ag policy from its inception, uh, and we ought to stand by that ag policy once it's put in place. We put it in place in 2008. Many trade-offs were made between conservation programs, commodity programs, uh, cotton and peanuts were in the mix. We will have those exact same conversations again this time next year. The, the Farm Bill will come to the floor, and those who disagree with the farm policy that's developed in the Act Committee will have ample opportunity to come to this floor and make these arguments once again. But to do this in an appropriations bill in basically a drive-by shooting manner, in my view, is wrong-headed. We ought to trust that the uh, Ag Committee will get this work done and get it done properly. The 2008 Farm Bill was put in place. Uh, ag producers across this country, bankers across this country, implement dealers across this country have looked at that as a deal. Most folks in the business world don't back up on a deal uh, when they don't have to. And we don't have to in this particular instance because, as I said to start this, is that it does not cost the taxpayer any money as long as prices are high. And CBO, most folks uh, estimate that in the near term, the uh, prices will not drop below 18 cents a pound for um, uh, peanuts or 52 cents a pound uh, for cotton. So I respectfully disagree with my colleagues' uh, attempt to uh, alter the farm bill. Uh, in this way, in an appropriations bill, and I would ask my colleagues to oppose the, uh, the amendment. Now you go back. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask to strike the last word. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? I'd like to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I think this amendment is very, very ill advised. Uh, storage and handling fees are an integral part of the peanut program and the cotton program. A uh, removal of these fees will strike against the growers, the farmers' bottom line. Uh, the current marketing loan rate is $355 per ton. There has been no increase in the peanut loan rate, which is the safety net, since the 2002 Farm Bill. Uh, with the new Farm Bill uh, expected to take place next year, it's unfair for the program to change dramatically in this final year of the 2008 Farm Bill. Peanut growers changed their program from a supply management program in 2002 
to a market and loan program. We eliminated the old quota system. This included a price reduction from $610 per ton to $355 per ton, market and loan. The growers will lose even more if the program suffers another $50 per ton reduction due to the elimination of the storage and handling fees. Peanuts are a semi-perishable commodity. Now, this is different from corn, from wheat, uh, and other commodities. It is economically unfeasible for producers to store their peanuts on the farm like other commodities such as corn and wheat. Uh, peanuts need a secure and an atmospheric controlled environment. Peanuts require intense and constant management in the warehouse storage, which a farmer does not have the skills to do. Without proper management, a farmer's peanuts could go from what is known as a SEG-1 loan price, which is the best, to a SEG-3 loan price, which is contamination uh, due to aflatoxin. Elimination of the storage, uh, the, uh, uh, storage and handling program uh, could certainly impact food safety, the safety of the product. Now, the shellers basically control 75% of the peanuts after the peanuts leave the farmer's control. Since the peanuts are semi-perishable semi and due to the highly concentrated shelling industry, farmers are at the mercy of shellers in terms of pricing. Uh, shellers could possibly force the farmer to have to accept a lower price that will cover the storage and handling costs. The farmer then has no alternative in selling the peanuts. That eliminates the competitive edge. Uh, this could effectively lower the loan rate to producers, uh, as I said, by $50 a ton. Uh, the storage and handling program has effectively been a no net cost program to the government. Thus, the elimination of it will not help to reduce the federal deficit. Again, we are here about to pull the rug out from under farmers who have relied upon what this Congress and what this government has done in setting farm policy starting for 2008 to 2012. Why would we come at this point and pull the rug out from under them, upset all of the plans? Many times they have made loans, they've had to purchase equipment, and particularly throughout the Southeast, the equipment that is required for Southeastern peanut uh, growers uh, and Southeastern farmers uh, is varied. We've got a broad portfolio. Unlike the Midwest, uh, we grow multiple crops. So if in the Southeast from Virginia all the way to Texas, uh, you will find that, that farmers will grow corn, they will grow grain, of course, they'll grow peanuts, they'll grow soybeans, uh, and they'll grow cotton. Each of those commodities at least will require three different kinds of equipment. And the combines and the equipment for cotton uh, costs, you know, anywhere from 250 to $350,000. Other equipment for peanuts, uh, for grain, $150,000, $500,000. This is going to undermine the bottom line. It's going to remove the competitive edge that American peanut growers have, and it's going to devastate our ability to maintain uh, the highest quality, the safest, uh, the most economical uh, peanuts anywhere in the world. So I think this is very, very ill-advised. I think it will undermine American agriculture. It will lessen our food security, and certainly that is the last thing that we need to do uh, because we're already energy insecure. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? The lady from Texas, I apologize. The clerk will designate.
Clerk will report the amendment. by reducing the amount made available for agricultural buildings and facilities and rental payments by $13 million and increasing the amount made available for the Office of the Secretary by $5 million. General ladies recognized for five minutes. I thank the uh, Chairman and I thank the um, Agricultural Appropriations Committee for their kindness and their deliberateness in this uh, very long evening. Uh, and as well uh, the ranking member along with the, the chairman. Uh, this is a simple amendment about food and about helping more Americans get healthy food. There's not one of us that does not understand how dry and difficult a desert is. This amendment is simply about food deserts in rural and urban areas. This amendment provides a $5 million increase to the Office of the Secretary to allow assistance to provide relief to those who are suffering from the lack of access uh, to food uh, quality. This is a healthy child, we would hope. That healthy child needs to have good food. These funds will increase the availability of affordable, healthy foods in underserved urban and rural communities particularly through the development or equipping of grocery stores and other healthy food retailers. Fast foods, restaurants, and convenience stores line the blocks of low-income neighborhoods, offering few, if any, healthy options. In rural areas, there may be no access at all. This particularly impacts African-American and Hispanic communities, and as I indicated, rural communities. This climate, in the difficult times that we have, requires us to be able to allow families to have access to good food. We also have the issues of obesity and, as well, nutrition. Food deserts impacted many districts, and I will say to you that Texas, in particular, has fewer grocery stores per capita than any other state. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 32 percent of all children in Texas face a nutrition issue. Targeting assistance to food desert areas will provide healthy food to affected areas, open new markets for farmers, create jobs, and bolster development in distressed communities. Farmers' markets are good ideas, but farmers' markets sometimes are difficult to find in our communities. And again, let me emphasize, this is about rural and urban areas. This initiative will provide for the availability of healthy food alternatives to some 23 million people living in food deserts. And let me just suggest to you that these families that we care for, families, young families of the military, many of you have heard stories where the military families are on food stamps. Many of them live in areas beyond their bases, and some of their families are back home in rural and urban areas. This amendment, which will provide an $8 million gift back to the government, will give a mere $5 million to provide uh, the opportunity uh, for those food desert loopholes, if you will, rural places in our nation where there are big gaps with access to food and as well urban areas to have access uh, to the opportunity for good and healthy food. With that, um, I yield back my time and ask my colleagues to support the Jackson Lee Amendment that addresses the question of helping those who need healthy food. Yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Chair, uh, I rise to oppose the amendment and move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized and, for five minutes. And, and my dear friend from Texas has worked diligently to find something to work out with this. Um, as I had indicated to her last night, we're trying to work on. Um, some alternatives and see if there's a way to do it. Uh, just in the last uh, 30 minutes, I've gotten something from GAO says that you could actually cut out $45 million from this plan, this program, and that it would not affect the uh, potential of it. So 
right now what I'll do, and I know my friend from California is rising, and let me yield to you because I know you, you probably have a different view, but I want to kind of keep the debate well, going. Well, go ahead. I'll strike the last word. Well, you got four minutes from me. You <laughs> can still strike the last word. That gives you, that gives you nine well, minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I have concerns about where the money comes from as all these bills are offsetting, but I think that the purpose here is should be funded. This is, um, you know, we have this whole initiative, and some of it's been attacked tonight about trying to get uh, healthy foods grown by American farmers to people in areas that are as called food deserts, as the gentlelady from Texas pointed out, that there are places that people just can't go. There isn't a grocery store. There isn't fresh fruits and vegetables. I mean, think of a 7-Eleven. And uh, that's the kind of convenience stores that are around. Even the one we use up here a couple blocks away is very limited in the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables it has. So what this initiative is all about, and it's the president's initiative too, is trying to um, get food. Get, it's, it's an educational process. I think the hardest culture, well, this is what I learned from living in another culture when I was a Peace Corps, the hardest thing to do is get people to change their eating habits. Uh, we all know that struggle when we go on a diet, but so it takes a lot. It takes a lot of education. It takes a lot of uh, support, but it also takes the need to have access to it. You need to have access to the fresh fruits and vegetables, and neither you, they can either come to you in a farmer's market, uh, or you can go to them. But if you have neither a farmer's market and there's nothing to go to. Uh, you have no option. And that's what this amendment is about, is getting some money into the program that will be able to outreach and getting good, nutritious food to families who most need it, who without that have a good chance of not growing up healthy, uh, high incidence of obesity, uh, high incidence of diabetes, uh, high risk issues that cost a lot of money for the taxpayers uh, when they have to go on dialysis or have to be uh, under treatment. So. We have spent many years here in the committee, and the chairman knows it very well, of looking at how do we uh, prevent this um, from happening. When the, when the choices are there, this is a preventable, these are preventable diseases and preventable ill health uh, situations. But we've got to reach out and do it, and that's what this amendment does, and I think it deserves support. Uh, if I could I'd be reclaim. Well, uh, a minute or two. I, I just I wanted to read this quote from GAO. It says the committee may wish to consider reducing the request for this initiative for FY12 by 45 million dollars until the effectiveness of these demonstration projects have been established. And I want to say to my friend from Texas, we we had some talk around this, but not directly addressing it, not direct the hearings. But I do remember, and the gentleman from California might, that safe, and, and I think uh, Ms. Foley might remember that the Safeway, I believe in Washington, D.C., has some sort of grant to uh, operate in a, uh, an area that was considered a food desert, and I believe that that is one of the most profitable Safeways there is. Uh, do, do either of you have a recollection of that? Thank you for pulling the rug out from under me, Ms. Foley. Um, I have a recollection. I, I, do yes. not, I do not yield you any more time from here on out. Now, you know, I do, do, you, do you remember that, Mr. Yeah. Farr, that discussion? Yeah. Was that not about uh, food deserts? Yes, it was. It's about, it's, 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 but it's also, we do it, in, you remember Ms. Kaptur's amendments in our committee of trying to subsidize farmers' markets to go into high-risk areas. Uh, to get it started so that it does develop a market approach and can be sustainable. But we reach out and do those kinds of things. Um, let, me, let me reclaim a little bit. Uh, this, uh, GAO has reported that a variety of approaches, including improving access to par targeted foods, have the potential to increase the consumption of targeted foods that could contribute to a healthy diet, but little is known about the effectiveness of these approaches. And so. I think what I would uh, like to do, Mr. Chairman, is continue to oppose this, but knowing my good friend from Texas and from California will keep this as a priority. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this. I, you know, the hour is late. Gentleman. The gentlewoman's been working on this for a long time, but the gentleman's time I is expired. need a little more focus on it before I could accept it. Yield back.
what purpose is the gentleman from New York rise? Strike. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Well, we have to finish this one. The well, gentleman was suspended. For what purpose is the gentleman from California rise? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I yield whatever time she may consume to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Lee. Chancellor. First of all, let me thank uh, Mr. Farr and Mr. Kingston. I would hope my friend from Georgia could see in his heart that this is uh, a very small microcosm for a very large issue, and that is that food deserts do exist, uh, and the families that are impacted, a uh, number of families that include uh, those who are members of the United States military from the very youngest child. Uh, I have been fiscally responsible, if that is the case, to narrow this very well. And I have no quarrel with individual chains uh, engaging in marketing outreach. But I'm talking about hard-to-serve areas that include urban and rural areas where there are no chains to engage, food chains, to engage in any benevolent assistance. I'm also suggesting to you that if you look at the landscape of districts across the nation, uh, just take, for example, uh, my district is number 32 in regards to food insecurity, but there are 31 above me. The people have limited access to food. Uh, I enjoy the uh, point that Mr. Farr made about Ms. Captor's uh, farmer's market. This will, this will infuse energy into the farmer's markets. This will create jobs uh, for uh, a limited amount of pilot resources. This is the right thing to do. Uh, this is to take a great land like America and say, we want everybody to minimally have the access to good, healthy, nutritious food. So I would ask uh, for the humanitarian consideration of my friends on the other side of the aisle. I thank the gentleman from California for his instructiveness and the work of the members of this uh, Appropriations Committee, and I ask my colleagues to support this amendment, the Jackson Lee Amendment, that fills the gaping hole of the lack of food by providing resources to cure uh, the problem of food deserts. And I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas. Those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The I amendment is not agreed to. I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will re report the amendment, will designate the amendment. Number 23. Amendment number 23, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Gibson of New York. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, over 50 congressional districts across our country have at least 10 percent of their population without high speed, uh, without access to high speed broadband. My district is one of these 50, over 50 districts. Now, this is a significant impediment to job creation. We have farmers without access uh, to, uh, to the high-speed broadband. We have many small businesses in our districts, including uh, bed and breakfasts, uh, which impact our tourism without that access. This amendment helps address this situation. Now, the underlying bill zeroes out the loan program for rural broadband. This is down from 22.3 million uh, that we just closed out a few months ago for FY11. And uh, with a healthy respect uh, for the leadership of the Agricultural uh, Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, I think this is a mistake. I know that there have been issues with this program in the past. I have uh, read the IG report. Uh, I will also say that uh, my understanding is the administration has made progress since the publishing of that report. Uh, one of the things that have been said about this program is it has not been able to address the significant uh, volume of requests, and I think it's important to note that in March 2011, they cleared the backlog uh, of all the applications for the program. And in fact, there's now uh, up to $100 million in new loan applications showing the interest in this program. Another criticism uh, has been that uh, this program is duplicative and that in fact that you can, uh, you can apply under telemedicine for rural areas. 
And I will tell you that uh, we have tried that in our district uh, with no success. And this program that I'm offering amendment today for $6 million, a loan program, fully offset, uh, is the only uh, program exclusively dedicated to rural broadband. And this program, this amendment, $6 million can give us access to over 100 and support over $100 million in loan applications. Mr. Chairman, this amendment will help create jobs and it will help our farmers with profitability. Of course I'm biased, but I believe we've got the smartest, the hardest working farmers in the world. Their issue is profitability and this amendment will help. And the CBO, the CBO assesses this amendment as neutral and it says that it will reduce outlays by $2 million in 2012. Let me say that again. CBO says this amendment will reduce outlays by $2 million in 2012. And so how do we offset this? How do we provide access for farmers and small businesses, access to a loan program? We cut the federal bureaucracy. $6 million in office rental payments. Now the USDA is blessed with some of the uh, most uh, significant office space among all the federal bureaucracy. And in addition to what they have here in the district, in Beltsville, Maryland, there is additional office space of which uh, they possess. So on top of all that, there's $151 million in this appropriations bill for rental of office space, including right here on M Street in Washington, D.C. This is a good pay for to give access to our farmers uh, so that they can have access to rural bre uh, broadband. So my, to all my colleagues, I say this is a good amendment, the only amendment that provides exclusive rural broadband access. It's supported by the American Farm Bureau. It's supported by the New York State Farm Bureau and numerous chambers of commerce in my district. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. And I'd like to yield the balance of my time to my good friend and colleague from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. I'd like to thank the gentleman for yielding the time and I thank the chair. I rise in support of the gentleman amendment. will suspend. The gentleman from New York must remain on his feet. The gentleman will continue. I rise in support of the amendment proposed by Mr. Gibson and Mr. Owens, as I think it is exactly what the American people want us to do here in Washington. The people expect us to be responsible with their tax money. The people have made it clear, more than clear, that the federal government is too big. Our job is to look for waste, inefficiencies, and bloat. The Gibson Owens amendment has found such bloat and seeks to remedy it. There is no doubt that the USDA does good work and that the agency should have suitable workspace to conduct its work. Indeed, as Mr. Gibson has pointed out, the USDA has 3 million square feet of prime office space on the National Mall in a beautiful building that contributes to the architectural beauty of the nation's capital. To learn that the USDA also has a campus in Maryland that occupies 45 acres of land is itself concerning. With all that office space currently available to the USDA in the Washington area and an additional $151 million to rent office space elsewhere, why does the USDA want to rent more office space in D.C.? The people of this country will not begrudge an architecturally distinguished office for the nation's capital, but a luxurious high rent office in addition is too much. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Chairman, I oppose the amendment and move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. And I want to say to the gentleman from Arizona, if I have time left over, I'll yield you some, but you can also get your own five minutes okay. if you want. Um, Mr. Chairman, I oppose this. I want to start out by saying that the committee has taken a really close look at this over the years, and I wish you could see from where you're sitting better the saturation level of broadband access in the United States of America. Um, that's in the blue. As you can see, the entire country is mostly blue according to this. But I would not want your eyes to just strain from there, so I can give you some numbers here. New Jersey, 100% penetration. Florida, 99.9% .9 penetration. New York, 99.8%. Georgia, 99.4%. Arizona, 98.2%. And I can submit this for the record, but this program is not necessary. And in the time when we're talking about saving money, we do not need to increase this account. 
The process is burdensome. We get lots of complaints of people who've had applications pending for a long time and they can't get it answered, can't get their questions answered, or they get approved but they can't get the money. The eligibility is too broad. And in many areas, it competes with private sector broadband service. Now, the IG report had a number of things that they found. They found that this rural broadband program granted loans of $103 million to 64 communities near large cities, including $45 million loans to 19 suburban subdivisions within a few miles of Houston, Texas. That's hardly the intent of the program. The IG report also found out that they were competing with pre-existing broadband access in many places and found that 159 of the 240 communities associated with the loans, that 66 percent, already had service. I'll repeat that, 66 percent of the communities who got grants already had service. Now, there was a little criticism, and the program was supposed to be reformed. But the IG took another look at it and found out in 2009 that only eight out of the 14 recommendations had had action taken on them. 34 of 37 applications for providers were in areas where there was already private operators offering service, 34 out of 37. So when our committee took a look at this, we felt like the program needed changing. It did not need new money. And so I must uh, respectfully disagree with my good friends who are offering this and stand in opposition of the amendment. With that, I, I yield to my friend from Arizona. And as you know, if you need more time, you can get five minutes Thank on top you. of that. Well, I'd like to disagree. And that is, as I serve a, a vast part of Arizona, 60% of Arizona, in which is supplied or, or serves a numerous number of Native American tribes, in which are fighting to try to get economic development and trying to get um, broadband service. And this is exactly the kind of funding that we want to direct you to the appropriate place. And the Native Americans are exactly the place that this could go. This is the economic development that they need, and they're currently in the process of trying to get that, and they're trying to build that infrastructure. And this is exactly where that fund is, that fund can be. And I redirect uh, the balance of my time to my good friend, Mr. Gibson. I, I will balance, give the balance to Mr. Gibson. I, I thank the chairman. I thank the gentleman from Arizona for yielding. And I just want to reiterate that uh, there is significant need uh, for expanding access to rural broadband in America. We've got over 50 districts that have at least 10 percent of their population that are not in the 21st century, that don't have access to the high-speed broadband. This kind of loan program, and I, and I want to remind my colleagues, uh, this program reduces outlays by $2 million in 2012, according to the CBO. This, this program should not be zeroed out. It should not go from $22 million to zero. We should, have, we should accept this amendment. I urge my colleagues to accept this amendment so that we can continue to make progress with rural broadband. And I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Hang on. Does, does the gentleman from Georgia yield back? Does the gentleman from Georgia yield back? Yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the general, general lady from Wyoming rise? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, move to strike the requisite number of words. General is recognized for five minutes. Respectfully, I, uh, my chairman and I disagree on this issue. I raised this in our subcommittee on uh, appropriations uh, and uh, his superior abilities to convince the subcommittee prevailed. Uh, but I weigh in on the side of Mr. Gibson and Mr. Gosar. And let me tell you why. The information that um, the committee chairman has is correct insofar as it gives you numbers on broadband access that will allow you uh, a speed uh, of receiving service that is so slow uh, that it is basically 20th century rather than 21st century communications. For example, under the speed at which the numbers uh, that the gentleman from Georgia has derived cover this 99-98% uh, coverage, 
it would take you nine hours to download a movie. Now, who's going to do that? Uh, but with this digital world we're in, the kinds of data that needs to be unloaded in order to be a lone eagle, to have a business, to have the type of uh, broadband as uh, access that my colleague from Arizona would like the Native Americans in his state to have, would require a much faster broadband service. And when you look at the speed of the broadband service that is consistent with having a robust community that has real broadband service, my state is at the rock bottom. Less than half of the people in my state have the kind of robust service that is typical of urban areas or suburban areas. The same could be said for my colleague from Arizona and the areas of his state uh, where Native Americans so desperately need the opportunity to market products over the internet. So I encourage uh, my colleagues to support the position of my colleagues, Mr. Gibson and Mr. Gosar, uh, and I rise in support of their amendment. And I would yield to the gentlelady from Ohio. I just wanted to ask the gentlelady if she would find the present time convenient to enter into the discussion regarding GIPSA, though uh, we are on this amendment at this point. Uh, with the chairman's leave, I would consent. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Would you, consent, would you consent to a departure as I use the remainder of my five minutes uh, to discuss the issue of the stockyards uh, and uh, the GIPSA rules? Gentlelady is recognized for the remaining and time. And I yield to my colleague from Ohio. I thank the gentlelady. And uh, while I will not offer an amendment uh, to strip section 721, uh, a legislative provision that prevents the U.S. Department of Agriculture from doing its job, as instructed in the Farm Bill, uh, relative to fair competition uh, in meat products so consumers get uh, fairly priced meats, I otherwise rise in strong opposition to the language that's in the bill. And when the authorizing committee wrote the Farm Bill, USDA was directed to use the existing Packers and Stockyards Act to restore fairness to livestock and poultry contract markets. But instead of allowing the agency to do its job, Congress in an uneven-handed way has allowed itself to become captured by the consolidated meat industry. And while ranchers, farmers, and producers are increasingly being squeezed out of the markets and small local slaughterhouses continue to close, large consolidated players manipulate the rules to favor their own business operations and meat prices rise. Congress simply can't stand by silent. So on behalf of the millions of farmers, ranchers, and producers that struggle every day to survive as they face the gargantuan task of competing against monopolistic entities, I oppose the base language in 721, and I would like to place two statements in the record, a letter from the American Farm Bureau opposing Section 721 and a letter from over 140 organizations supporting the pro-competition proposals made by the Department of Agriculture. The meat packers have a stranglehold on this House, scaring members with millions of dollars in campaign contributions and real threats of political retribution. Instead of engaging in well-meaning public debate and attempting to win on the merits of the argument, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which has a right to speak out but not a right to intimidate, sent out a national notice to its members to harass the American Farm Bureau. This is not the nature of well-meaning debate and for many has crossed the line of propriety. I urge my colleagues to resist the misinformation and to stand strong for independent producers and family farmers and ranchers. Section 721 of the base bill goes further than many realize. It will stop USDA from conducting its economic analysis of this industry. Um, the gentleman's request will be covered by General Leaf. Is it possible to gain additional time? Mr. Chairman? For what purpose does gentleman rise? I move to strike the requisite number of words. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the gentlelady from Ohio. Balance so much time as she may consume. I thank the gentleman so very much for that kind effort. Thank you. Um, the current uh, proposal will silence the nearly 60,000 
uh, comments on the rule because it will prevent USDA from reading the record. And finally, it will undermine long overdue fairness in poultry and livestock contracts for millions of farmers, ranchers, and producers. By allowing Section 721 to remain in the bill, the House is standing with uh, the few big meat packers and against the many thousands and thousands of producers. To understand how illogical this committee's action is, I refer the House to the committee report where on competition issues the committee directed USDA to submit legal documents by June 10th, five days ago, and before the House began consideration of this bill. On its face, the committee has directed the agency to comply with something before the House has even considered the bill. Is this proper? Furthermore, I would note that ironically, if Section 721 were to be implemented, the agency would not be able to comply with its own report language. If there ever was a time that the Appropriations Committee has overstepped its bounds, this is it. After the 2002 Farm Bill, this committee prevented USDA from implementing an important provision of law known as the Country of Origin Labeling. It was the same consolidated meatpacking industry crying from the rafters with claims of exaggerated economic costs which was behind the meat labeling cool delay. We seem to have returned to the dark days recycling the same talking points. It took us almost eight years and finally consumers now have the legal right to see where their meat comes from, which is what the vast majority of the American people wanted. So on behalf of the millions of farmers, ranchers, and independent producers, I pledge to continue this fight and to prevent a similar eight years of delay and confusion on USDA competition rules in the meat industry. Let USDA do its job, and I want to yield my time to the gentleman and the gentlelady, and I thank them so much for their consideration. I claim my time, and I thank the gentlelady for attention to this matter, both gentleladies for their attention to this matter and for standing up with and for the best interests of agriculture, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. Those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a report of that. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York will be postponed. Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon rise? I'm ready to leave. I swear to God. I'm ready to fucking leave. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number three, printed in the congressional record offered by Mr. Blumenauer of Oregon. Mr. Chairman, these are challenging budget, <laughs> difficult economic times. But unfortunately, uh, there really are alternatives to slashing environmental payments and nutritional support in the Farm Bill. There is an alternative to reform and modernize. The last Farm Bill uh, pretended to start limitations in payments, but uh, exempted from uh, the modest limitations in some areas were market loan payments, loan deficiency payments, and commodity certificates not capped. This means that entities can virtually receive unlimited Title I dollars under the current law. Mr. Chairman, it's important for us as we are dealing with trying to reduce the strain on the federal budget to do so in a way that is strategic. The amendment I propose would establish a $125,000 payment limitation in total. Now, this will save two-thirds of a billion dollars. Now, bear in mind that we are now cutting existing environmental contracts if this bill came forward. There are still, uh, the majority of farmers and ranchers in this country uh, still receive nothing. 62% receive nothing. In my state of Oregon, it's 87% of the farmers and ranchers. It's time to start with modest restriction on government subsidies. There are a wide range of areas in this budget uh, as it's working its way through the House, we're going to see very dramatic reductions, uh, almost a third in transportation. We sliced a billion dollars from sewer and water programs to state and local government. At a time of record high farm commodity prices, 
this would be a time to place this modest limitation. There's actually uh, a question whether or not uh, some of these payments even go to farmers at all. In 2009, some of the entities that receive Title I handouts, the Fidelity National Title Institute, received over $4.85 million. Almost $3 million went to the LeSueur County Abstract Company. The American Marketing Peanut Association received largesse from the federal government worth over $3.98 million. These, these aren't small family farmers that I think all of us would like to support. In this, in this day and age, it's embarrassing to be giving away $4 million uh, taxpayer money in one year to a private for-profit company when I think what we should be doing is concentrating on the support for America's farmers and ranchers. We have the opportunity with this amendment to take a step in this direction. I would strongly urge that my colleagues join with me in adopting this amendment, uh, establishing a $125,000 overall limit, <coughs> excuse me, and be able uh, to start saving two-thirds of a billion dollars <coughs> and sending a signal that we're serious about ref ref reforming spending. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. This amendment would have far-reaching and devastating effects uh, for America's farmers. I'm not sure the gentleman is aware of the full extent of this amendment. This amendment throws the non-insured crop disaster program into an arbitrary payment limit scheme. This program, which farmers pay a fee to obtain crop insurance coverage, protects them from catastrophic events like flooding and tornadoes. If this amendment passes, farmers who have been flooded out are quite literally up a creek without a paddle. They won't get the coverage they've signed up for, even though they've paid in. This amendment would also affect the permanent disaster program. Producers were required to purchase crop insurance to be eligible for that program. This amendment would be a bait and switch. They fulfilled their end of the bargain, but we're pulling the rug out from under them now. There's a time and a place to debate the appropriate level of support for farmers. I welcome that debate as a part of the 2012 Farm Bill process, which will in effect begin next week. The Agriculture Committee will be auditing farm programs for effectiveness and efficiency, and then will seek input from across the country on the best way to support our farmers and ranchers while making good use of taxpayer dollars. Discussing farm programs in the context of a farm bill will represent honest, transparent policy making. This amendment prevents that discussion from taking place by altering the terms of the contracts with farmers once they've already been signed. Protecting farmers during catastrophic weather events is the least we can do to maintain a stable food supply in our country. My colleagues in the Midwest have seen firsthand the devastation that comes with flooding. My colleagues in the Southwest know how droughts can turn healthy farms into desolation. For that reason alone, I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. But I also urge you to oppose it because policy changes like this should be conducted within the broader context of all Farm Bill policy. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment and I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. What purpose for the gentleman? Chairman, the uh, rise? I rise to oppose the amendment and uh, strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, oppose this amendment. I want to associate myself with my remarks of uh, with the remarks of Chairman Lucas. Uh, and in the 08 Farm Bill, uh, we spent a lot of time working through this payment limitation issue. Uh, there were a lot of different ideas, and a lot of different uh, discussions, and uh, it was not easy. We, we made significant reforms. 
uh, in this payment limitation uh, area. And as the chairman indicated, uh, you know, we came to a resolution and people are relying on that. We've got a five-year farm bill uh, and people make decisions not from year to year. We make them on the long term. And it's just not fair to come in and change things, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the stream. One of the other things we did is we applied the farm, the uh, payment limitations to all of the programs. And as I understand this amendment, it only uh, applies to the commodity title. So we're once again going to create a different set of payment limitations for one part of the farm program compared to another. Uh, I don't know exactly what the purpose of this is uh, because the farm programs are not uh, designed to be a welfare program or to pick winners and losers and decide how big a farm is going to be and all that sort of stuff. The purpose of these farm programs is to support production agriculture so we can feed this country and frankly feed the world. And you read all these stories coming from all over the, the, the world that uh, we're worried that we're going to have enough food to, to feed the, all the increase in population, all that stuff. Uh, you know, if you go down this track, you're going to go down a policy that's going to uh, make it very difficult for us to feed the world. So this is ideology run amok. Uh, you know, we, some people that uh, have problems with uh, the way we've designed the safety net, and I think we could do a better job. But, uh, you know, this is just the wrong thing to do. This is too complicated an issue to settle here on the floor in a few minutes of debate. And uh, it's just not fair to the people that have made uh, long-term decisions and invested a lot of money uh, based on expecting that this farm bill was going to be in this form until uh, September 30th of 2012. So I encourage my uh, colleagues to oppose this amendment and yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut rise? Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the amendment offered by my colleague from Oregon, and with all due respect to the ranking member, uh, I think the effort to limit these subsidies is both fiscally responsible, uh, more in keeping with the kind of market economics that so many of us in this chamber believe are the right way to go and will help the health of the American people, something that will have a dramatic impact on the rising health care costs in this country. Mr. Chairman, the amendment would limit the total Title I payments to farm entities to less than $125,000 a year. It doesn't eliminate them, it simply limits them. Under current law, market loan payments, loan deficiency payments, and commodity certificates are not capped, and entities can receive unlimited Title I dollars. Mr. Chairman, four hours ago in this chamber, we debated amendments that would eliminate and gut the WIC program, WIC. Women, infants, and children. This is a program that, see, that, that seeks to provide basic foodstuffs to poor children, to poor families. There were amendments that would eliminate the Food for Peace program, whereby we send food in those bags that we've all seen, a gift from the people of the United States of America to people who are starving around this planet, a gift from the people of the United States of America at a moment when we can use friends. And we said we're going to gut them. We're going to reduce them. Why would you do that? You would only do that if you faced the kind of budget constraints that we face today. A brutal necessity to find savings. Here we have nearly a billion dollars, an opportunity to, spend, to, to save nearly a billion dollars in subsidies to large producers. These are not small farmers. As my colleague from Oregon said, the top 10% of subsidy recipients receive almost three quarters of these funds. This is not the small farmer. These are big conglomerates. These subsidies are bailouts. We hear a lot about bailouts in this chamber, and bailouts, nobody thinks bailouts are a good thing. These are slow motion, year in and year out bailouts of an industry. Many of my colleagues support both the goals of fiscal responsibility and the idea that markets are efficient. Here, not only are we taking taxpayer dollars and sending them to a slow motion, perpetual bailout, but we're doing it in such a way that creates cheap corn sugars and other things that go into the fast food that, create to the, that, that, that exacerbate the obesity problem in this country. 
This is a bad idea. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment for both fiscal, health, and sheer market grounds. And with that, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to my colleague from Oregon. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words and your thoughtful analysis. The approach that we are taking here is to put an overall limit of $125,000 uh, in, in addition to what we're talking about. Uh, this would have only affected uh, six, about 6,500 entities in 2009. Uh, it's an appropriate step forward. I hear some of my colleagues concerned about changing the rules for a few thousand people who are getting huge amounts of subsidy. You know, this bill will change the rules for uh, tens of thousands of farmers and ranchers who would otherwise get environmental uh, protections, uh, payments for, in, uh, for uh, in environmental programs. In fact, some of the existing contracts would be abrogated. Now, there's going to be lots of changes going on. I hope that we start now beginning the process of agriculture reform and making clear that we want to start by putting some overall limitation and during a time of record high farm prices. Um, there's never a good time to do it. I think the time to do it is now. I look forward to a spirited debate on farm bill reform. I hope at some point we're able to actually do some meaningful reform, uh, as acknowledged by even the proponents from the committee, that, this, that we've got lots of problems with the existing bill. Uh, we could do a better job. It's complicated. Well, this isn't complicated. This is straightforward and direct, and I urge uh, an I vote in support of the amendment, and I uh, yield back the time to my colleague who allowed me to speak. Thank you, and I yield.